Now that was Solomon's prayer when the temple was built. One of the longer prayers that you find in the Bible, but he certainly covered every topic, didn't he? Today we want to talk about what is God like? What is God like? And as we uh, discover that, I think you'll find some interesting characteristics of God. But first let's give some intro as to what is taking place. Solomon is king, and he wastes absolutely no time getting to work. In chapter 4, he chooses his cabinet. He chooses the commander of the army. He chooses 12 officials to take care of the king's quarters, one each month. <clears throat> Incidentally, he didn't need any confirmation hearings. And that's because he was sovereign. He was the king. And so he could choose whom he wanted. In chapter 5, he prepares to build the temple. His father David told him he was going to build the temple in 1 Kings 5.5. 5, and so I intend to build a house for the name of the Lord my God, as the Lord said to David my father, your son, whom I will set on your throne in your place, shall build the house for my name. In chapter 6, he builds the temple. In chapter 7, he builds his palace at the same time the temple is being constructed. Both tasks took about 12 years to accomplish. At the end of chapter 7, all the furniture from the tabernacle, that was the tabernacle in the wilderness and all that furniture, is brought into the temple while thousands of sheep were being sacrificed. And then something special happened. The Lord makes a special appearance. In 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 10, when the priest came out of the holy place, a cloud filled the house of the Lord, so that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. In 40 years of ministry, twice I've experienced that sense where the Lord fills the place. We were in McCormick Place, and I think I've told you the story, singing How Great Thou Art, 10,000 Christians singing. And as we got to the line, rolling thunder, this clear, sunny, beautiful day, all of a sudden, the clouds ripped loose, thunder began rolling throughout the city of Chicago, and 10,000 of us broke out in praise. It was an exciting moment. As soon as that line passed, the thunder stopped. I can only think that God spoke. And then one time in preaching many years ago in a church in Illinois, we could just sense God entered the sanctuary. And after the service, people came up to me and said, did you feel it? Did you see what happened? That's only happened twice in my life. God does not normally walk in the room. But in this case, as Solomon dedicates the temple, a great experience, a cloud fills the house of the Lord. And, and those ministering couldn't even stand. It was so magnificent. Well, the new tabernacle was about, the new temple was about double the size of the tabernacle. The temple was smaller than our church, though. It was 120 by 60 feet, but it was a little taller. It was 45 feet high. I did the math on that, and they came out, that came out to 324,000 cubic feet. So I thought, well, let's see what the difference is. And so our church is 120 by 90 by 30. I multiplied that, and did you know our church is exactly 324,000 cubic feet? Now, how do you get that? Go figure. I, had, I, I did not sit down and plan that when we built. It just worked out that way. And then the uh, worship center... Is, uh, is approximately 10,800 square feet. So we're larger inside in terms of footage that we can use. But uh, the Family Life Center is 7,056 square feet on the floors. And the, actually, the temple was 7,200 square feet. So if you want to get an idea of how big the temple was in square footage, just go to the building next door, and you'll get a pretty good idea of how big the temple actually was. It's pretty interesting. Of course, the temple did not seat people. You see, in the way the temple worship was, is the people were on the outside, and the priests would do the offering, and then they would go in and pray for the people inside. The only ones allowed in the temple were the Levites, the priests, and, and uh, anybody else would be in serious trouble if they walked into the temple. See, in one sense, God was unapproachable. It wasn't until Jesus Christ came into the world and was crucified, that we were invited to the inside. We're now invited to the inside. Mark chapter 15, verse 37, Jesus utters a loud voice, breathes his last. Now notice what happens. The curtain of the temple which separated the 
Holy of Holies from the holy place. The curtain of the temple was torn, but notice how it was torn from top to bottom. So there would be no question that God has opened the door for men to come in and men and women to come in and worship him. And the barrier that once existed no longer existed because of what Christ did on the cross. Well, the temple took seven years to build, and uh, it was an elaborate, costly structure. Some 183,000 people worked on the project. Now, they didn't all show up at one time. They each had the different areas had 12-month duty where they would have to send a whole bunch of people to work on the temple project. I want you to see the picture there. <clears throat> That's an idea. The temple, of course, being in the middle and then the wall surrounding it, and a court of Gentiles and so forth. But uh, that's the idea of how magnificent and how wonderful this structure was. And of course, one of the reasons it was so costly is just about everything in it was overlaid with gold. And so it was a very expensive uh, project. And now it's done. The furniture's in. God has arrived, and Solomon begins to pray a prayer of dedication. Verse 22 of chapter 8, Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the assembly of Israel and spread out his hands towards heaven. So he's standing there, and he begins to lead the congregation. I'm imagining thousands, because they had slaughtered thousands of sheep that day. And, and uh, he's now offering a prayer. And in that prayer, we can find lots of things in that prayer and spend probably a few weeks on it. But what I wanted to do is pull out of the prayer four descriptions of God that Solomon mentions in the course of the prayer. And we'll look at them. And as we look at them, I think we'll discover what God is like. The first description is this. God is remarkable. God is remarkable. Now, in other words, he's one of a kind. 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 23. O Lord God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth beneath. The truth is, the Bible teaches that if you worship any other God, you're really not worshiping a God. You're worshiping demons. And, and that's what the Bible teaches. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14 tells us Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. He looks good to people. Sometimes we get this picture of Satan with a pitchfork, you know, and no, no, he disguises himself as an angel of light. 1 Corinthians 10.20 says, What pagans sacrifice, they offer to demons and not to God. So they may think that they're worshiping God, but they are not. They are offering to demons and not God. And he says, I don't want you to be involved in that. Do not participate with demons. Moses, as he's dying, remembers the, reminds the children of Israel of the error that they made. And they made it rather quickly. You know, they, they crossed the, the Red Sea. They're out in the wilderness. Moses goes up to the mountain to get the Ten Commandments. They take a, he takes a while to come back. And what do they do? They want a physical God that they can build and, and they can worship. And so Aaron, of course, collects the gold and out comes a, uh, a golden calf. And Moses reminds them of their idolatry in Deuteronomy 32, 16. They stirred him to jealousy. Our God is a jealous God. And with strange gods... With abominations, they provoked him to anger. Notice this, they sacrificed to demons that were not gods. Now, they called them gods, but they were not gods. They were demons to gods they had never known, to new gods that had come recently, whom your fathers had never dreaded. So, when you worship a god, apart from the god of the Bible, you're actually worshiping demons, and that's what is so serious about the issue. In fact, it even says before we were Christians, before we discovered what it was to know Christ as Lord and Savior and be forgiven of our sins. Galatians 4, verse 8 says, Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature, notice this, are not gods. And it's important to understand that. It's very clear that the God of the Bible claims to be the only true God and Solomon is acknowledging that. Now, when you say that, that's a pretty big claim, isn't it? The God of the Bible is the only true God. Any other God is a false God. In fact, behind that is demons. That's a heavy statement to make. Is there any reason to accept it? Well, let's look at this. If God is truly God, he's omnipotent. Now, omnipotent means he's all-powerful. He's supreme. Now, let me ask this question. How many supreme beings can you have? How many omnipotent beings can you have? You can only have one. 
You're either omnipotent or you're not. You can't have two gods that are omnipotent. You can only have one. The God of the Bible is a God who is described as omnipotent and supreme. Well, the next question is, why would I believe the Bible? Well, there's a lot of good reasons for me to believe the Bible and put my faith in the God of the Bible. How about prophecy? When the Bible predicts something, it happens thousands of years ahead of time. God tells us what's going to happen. Why? Because he's supreme. He's sovereign. He's the one who controls all things. How about preservation? You know, the Bible is the most preserved book in the world. More manuscripts. We know exactly what was written in the, in the Bible because the manuscripts have been preserved so wonderfully. No other book in the world can even come close to claiming what the Bible can claim. How about the resurrection of Christ? That's pretty remarkable, wouldn't you think that? The most attested to historical event that mankind knows, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. How about archaeology? Every time they go out digging, even unbelievers, well, you know what they do? They find out that what they dig corresponds with what the Bible says. Always does, and always will, because God is supreme. He knows exactly what he's doing. It's indestructible. You know how many nations have tried to wipe out the Bible? You know what happens? They go, the Bible stays. It all happens. It's a course of time, but it'll happen, and it continues to happen. And influence. How many people do you know that have been radically changed when they discovered Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior? That's, that, that's why we can trust the Bible. And when the Bible says that God is supreme, he's omnipotent, he's the only one, you can have confidence that he is supreme, omnipotent, and the only one. But some people might say something like this. Don't all religions teach the same thing? Aren't people just using another name for God? And let's, let's say this. There are some similarities in religion. For instance, many religions teach the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. A lot of religions talk about love and, and loving one another. That's, that's fine. But see, the problem is, if you focus on the sameness, you miss the issue. It's not what is the same, it's what is different that counts. Recently, I had to take some prescriptions. I'm not used to taking pills. And, and one of the things I kept finding myself doing is I would have a couple white pills on the counter, and I would say, what is that? Didn't I take that one already? I don't want to put that in my mouth. That might be, that might be an explosion waiting to happen. And, and so I'm not used to taking prescriptions of any kind. And here's, here's the idea. If, if you had two white tablets, one of them was labeled aspirin, and the other was labeled arsenic, but they looked identical, would you say they're the same? No. So it's not the sameness that matters. It's the difference. One will help you, the other will kill you. And in, and, and in all these different religions, yeah, there's some sameness, but you need to back up and check out what are the differences. And when you figure that out, you'll discover that Christianity is totally different. You, for instance, not only do religions talk about these things, but basically all of these religions have what we call works salvation. How do you get to God? How do you please God? How do you get to whatever? By, by, by all the things that you do. Christianity is different. It's not what you do. It's what Christ has done. And when you put your faith in what Christ has done, it's Christ that does the transforming work within you. It is totally different than any other faith on the earth. And it's important for us to remember that. It is not a work salvation. It is by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, lest any man should boast. Not of works. So, the next thing we need to realize is Jesus made the claim that he was the only way to God. Now, let me ask you a question. If Jesus claims to be the only way of God, there's only two ways we can approach this. Either it's true or it's false. If he claims to be the only way to God, there can't be another way. It can't be that way. It just logically doesn't work out. You remember Fiddler on the Roof? Some of you do, and some of you don't. But in Fiddler on the Roof, uh, Tevye, the, the star, He's, he's out dishing out milk to the crowd, and a guy runs in with a newspaper, and he, and he reads an article how Jews had been dispersed from a certain town by the Russian government, and, and then they're, what, what does this mean? Ah, the, the, let's not worry about it. We've got our own problems. And then all of a sudden, a young college student shows up on the scene, and he starts, he starts getting upset with them because they're ignoring this because he knows it's going to be coming to their town. And so the young college student wants to, wants to wake them up. You should know... What's going on in the outside world, he says. 
And a man in the crowd responds, why should I break my head about the outside world? Let, the, let, let the outside world break its own head. And Tevye looks at him and he says, you're right. As the good book says, if you spit in the air, it lands in your face. The young college student isn't detracted. He says, nonsense. You can't close your eyes to what's happening in the world. Tevye looks at him and he says, he's right. And then another man says, they both can't be right. And Teva looks at him and he says, you're right also. That's how mixed up it is when you understand if Jesus says he's the only way, he's either the only way or he's not. It's that simple. He's either telling the truth or he's not really God and he's lying to us. That's simple. And once you come to that conclusion, the only thing is, does the Bible have enough credibility? Is there enough reason for me to put faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and trust him as the only way? And the evidence is there. It's just a matter of looking for it. God is remarkable because he's one of a kind. There is none other. Secondly, God is remarkable in the kindness that he shows his creation. God is unique among the gods of the world, which do not do very well by what they call their people. But God of heaven is a God of kindness. Listen to what he says in 1 Kings 8, 23. Keeping covenant and showing steadfast love to your servants who walk before you with all their heart. And yet, uh, consider the magnitude of God. He's the supreme almighty God. And he, and, he, and he deals with us in love, and he keeps covenant. Listen, he says in chapter 8, verse 27, but will God indeed dwell on earth? Because heaven, behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you, how much less this house that I have built. Isn't it a marvelous thing that the almighty, supreme, all-powerful God pays attention to you, is interested in you? I mean, I find that absolutely amazing. Now, one of the things I love about God is I can talk to him and you can talk to him at the same time and he doesn't get confused. It's not an issue. He's the supreme, almighty God. We can call him any time. And this God who created the heavens and the earth actually wants a relationship with you. What a wonderful and glorious thing that is. As immense and as powerful as he is, he cares for his creation. And instead of leaving man with no hope, he provides a way for sinful man to be in a right relationship with him. What makes our God so remarkable is that he reached down to man. In all the other faiths, man is reaching up trying to get to God. But in the faith of the Bible, God reaches down and seeks out man and makes it possible for man to be right with him. Because while we were yet sinners, while we were still helpless, Christ died for us. And that's what God does. That's one of the reasons he's so remarkable. So he's remarkable, and he's also reliable. God is reliable. 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 24. You have kept with your servant David, my father, what you declared to him. You spoke with your mouth, and with your hand you have fulfilled it. Here's what God does. He keeps his word. He's reliable. The wisest thing that we can do is learn to take God at his word. 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 26. Now, therefore, O God of Israel, let your word be confirmed, which you have spoken to your servant David, my father. There's an old saying. You know, years ago, we used to say, a man's handshake. All we need to do is handshake because a man's word is his bond. I'm not so sure in this day of lawyers that that's necessarily as true as that was before. But I can tell you this. God's word is his bond. If God says it, you can rely on it. You can count on it. You don't have to worry about it. If God says it, you've got it. It's a bond. And there are some things that we're responsible for. But when God gives us a promise, he keeps it. Hebrews, of course, says that for us to be able to see God work in that way in our lives, we must have faith. Hebrews 11:6. without faith, it's impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. You know, sometimes people shake a fist at God, and the reason is they'll not trust him. But the word of God gives us so many reasons to put our faith in God and to trust him. In fact, James says that when we ask God, we should ask in faith, not wishful thinking, faith. What do we, what do, we do? We ask God 
for that which he has promised in his word. Well, what are the some of the things? Well, God has promised many wonderful things. But, they, but, but Solomon says, let your word be confirmed. Here's how God confirms it. He promised you peace, peace that passes human understanding. If you don't experience peace, it's not because God doesn't want to give it to you. It's because we don't trust him. He's promised us not only peace, but his presence. You wake up in the morning, you lie down in bed, and you, you sense the presence and the joy of God in your heart. You know that the Lord is with you. He's never going to leave you. He's never going to forsake you. He's promised that presence. You've experienced it if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, and God continually reveals himself. He promised us power, power to do that which is right instead of do that which is wrong, power to have victory over the old man and say yes to righteousness and no to sin. He has promised that to us, and he gives it to us, and he keeps his word. And then he's promised us purpose in life. You know, there's something wonderful about waking up each day knowing why you exist and what God has you on earth for. And one of the purposes we, we're here for is to be ambassadors of Christ, to be able to share what Christ has done in our own lives and introduce other men and women to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so God keeps his word. Now, what keeps us from it? Well, it's really a matter of faith and a matter of the heart. See, if we're double-minded and, and unfaithful, we find that the very promises of God, we somehow they're, they're out of our reach. It's not because God doesn't want to bring them to us. It's that we are living life our way instead of his way. Matthew says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And many times what we're really seeking, God is on the side. But God wants to be center. Why not? He's the supreme God. He's the creator of the heavens and the earth. What position do you think he wants in our lives? He wants the very center of all that we are. Follow hard after God, and you will be able to declare as Solomon did in 1 Kings 8, 56. Blessed be the Lord who has given rest to his people Israel according to all that he has promised. Not one word has failed of all his good promises which he spoke by Moses, his servant. And you'll look back at life as you dedicate your life to the Lord and live for the Lord and serve the Lord. And you will see over and over and over again the hand of God in your life and how he has fulfilled his promises in your life and given you all that you need to live a good and righteous life. God is remarkable. God is reliable. But here's the third description. God is righteous. 1 Kings chapter 8 Verse 31, if a man sins against his neighbor and is made to take an oath and comes and swears his oath before your altar in this house, then hear in heaven and act and judge your servants, condemning the guilty by bringing his conduct on his own head and vindicating the righteous by rewarding him according to his righteousness. God's righteousness is perhaps not talked about as much as his other attributes. Everybody likes to walk around and say, God is love. God is love. Yes, that's true. God is love. But he's much more than that. He's much more complex than simply saying God is love. God is good. Yes, he is. God is good. God is full of mercy. Yes, he is. He is full of mercy. God is patient. Yes, God is patient. But we also need to know this. God is holy. God is a holy and a righteous God. Now, holiness seems to have lost some indication in our language and our culture. But here's what it means. God is morally perfect. He's morally perfect. God's nature is such that which is not morally perfect must come under condemnation. In one effect, God can't help himself. That is, God can't change his nature. His nature is that he's righteous, he's holy, he's just, and when you violate that righteousness and holiness and justice, it brings with it condemnation, a penalty. And, and that's why the cross was so needed. Solomon recognized this in, in 1 Kings 8, 46. If they sin against you, for there is no one who does not sin. I, I love to use this when I testify with people and share Christ. They'll say, well, God has to accept me into heaven. I said, on what basis? Well, I'm a good person. Well, let's examine that. Let's see if you're, you are. And, and, and listen, have you ever told a lie? I've told a lie in my life a few times. Have you? Oh, of course, everybody lies. Oh, okay. We, we agree that we're both liars. I say, have you ever steal anything? You know, and I, I tell them when I was a kid, I used to shake my mother's cigarette pack and steal a cigarette out of it. You know, and oh yeah, I, I did something like that when I was a kid too. So you're a liar and a thief. Yeah. 
So you think God should let liars and thieves into heaven? You're a good person. Oh, I see what you mean. Well, now, what do you think? If you did something, a crime, do you think there would, justice would require a payment for that crime? Oh, yeah, I, I get you, I get you. I said, well, why would you trust yourself then? I think you need a savior. See, the bottom line is, we know. We know that we're wretched. We know that we're sinners. And, and, and what, what happens? No one does not sin. And it says, you are angry with them and give them to an enemy so that they are carried away, captive to the land of the enemy, far off. In other words, God brings judgment. God must deal with sin. His nature requires, requires it. He can't let us off the hook. But I want you to understand something else about the nature of God. He gets no pleasure in dealing with sin. In Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 23, Have I any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Lord, and not rather that he should turn from his way and live? God is offering to all mankind a way out. He is saying, I can satisfy my justice on this hand, and I can forgive you and give you grace and be in fellowship with you on this hand. If you will just come to me and receive what I've got for you. Righteousness demands that God must deal with sin and the sinner. And this is the only way justice can be satisfied. And what was the temple all about? It was a place of sacrifice and substitution over and over again. Animals by the thousands would be brought there. People would lay their hands on a symbol that the innocence of the animal would be passed to him and the guilt of the sinner would be passed to the offering so that the animal would be slain and the man could be made acceptable in the sight of of God. This is called atonement. Our sins are paid for. But God was actually looking into the future. One day Jesus would become the sacrifice that would pay the price for all sin. After all, the blood of bulls and goats could not take away sin. It was a covering. But then Jesus came in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 12. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. It is finished. And what Christ did on the cross is sufficient. You say, well, you don't know how bad I am. You don't know how great God is. The, 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 the sacrifice that Christ did on the cross is sufficient for every sin that any man, woman, or child could ever commit. And God covered it all on the cross. And what we simply need to do is receive that forgiveness and, and accept him as our Lord and Savior. And we will be forgiven. Now, there are two steps in, in this prayer that Solomon points out. That for us to get right with God. And here's the first one. First, you must turn to God. Obviously, you're not going to turn to somebody you don't believe in. You turn to God. And, 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 and that's a turning around. We meant, repentance means to change your mind. So you turn to God. And you admit your failure. Lord, would you, will you forgive me? I, I really did this action. And I have displeased you, sinned against the holy God. You turn to God. And second, that, that process of what we just said, you confess. Confess means to agree with God about your sin. If God calls it sin, whatever else you call it doesn't matter. Agree with God about your sin. And, and so he said if they turn towards here and they raise their hands, they confess and they cry out to God, then God is free to forgive. It's a wonderful thing. The price has already been paid. God's justice has already been satisfied. The only thing required now is for you to receive that free gift. And God is free to forgive. And that's his promise. If you will call on the name of the Lord, you will be saved. And if you sin as a Christian, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness over and over. You say, well, how long will God put up with me? For all of eternity. But don't worry, when you get to heaven, he's fixing that old sin nature. And you won't have that problem. But all through your life, all you need to do, when you sin, all you need to do is confess. And God says, we're right again. We're on the same path. I've forgiven your sins. And I've cleansed you from all unrighteousness. So Solomon got an answer to his prayer. And we find this in 2 Chronicles chapter 7. It's a famous passage that's often read. It really is an answer to the prayer that Solomon prayed in dedicating the temple. He says in 2 Chronicles 7:11, Thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord and the king's house 
all that Solomon had planned to do in the house of the Lord and in his own house, he successfully accomplished. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon in the night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as the house of sacrifice. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence among my people, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. And that's how God works. Solomon said, if they sin, God says, I've heard your prayer. And if my people will simply call out to me and they'll pray, they seek my face, they turn from their wicked ways, I will heal, hear from heaven and I will forgive them. By now, Solomon is on his knees. He's wrapped up in worship. Something has happened. He begins the prayer like this. But when he ends the prayer, look what happens. Solomon stood before the Lord. This is the beginning of the prayer. Before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the assembly of Israel and spread out his hands towards heaven. But somewhere in the midst of the prayer, Solomon drops to his knees. He is so overwhelmed with the glory and the grace of God. First Kings chapter 8, 54. Now as Solomon finished offering this prayer and plead to the Lord, he arose from before the altar of the Lord where he had knelt with hands outstretched to heaven. Something happened to Solomon. He got wrapped up in the greatness and the grandeur and the glory of God. And when he got wrapped up in all those things, he's standing like this, but then he's on his knees. Have you ever been overwhelmed with the greatness and the glory and the grandeur of God? The fact that you know that you're a sinner, you know your failings, yet God says you're accepted. You're mine. You belong to me. And I forgive you. What a wonderful thing. And now Solomon is on his knees. Why? Because in his prayer, he just rehashed what God is like. God is remarkable. God is reliable. God is righteous. But here's the great part. For me, God is responsive. He will hear my cry. That's what God is like. Let's pray together. Father, we can talk to you and you hear us. We can cry out in misery and you hear us. We can go astray and return and you hear us. You do not change. And you've told us what you're like. You are the supreme God, and we worship you. There is none like you. We worship you today, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, and God bless you.